Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we look into important scientific ideas and see how they correspond with the truth of Christianity. Today, we're joined again by Fuzz Rana, and we're going to address a perceived challenge to the Christian faith called the endosymbiont hypothesis. Fuzz, nice to have you on studio again. Jeff. So this is uh, probably a term that most people are not familiar with, but I know you get this question a lot as you talk about science faith issues. And so let's just kind of break it out. What is the endosymbiont hypothesis and why as a Christian should we care about it? Yeah, well, this is actually considered to be one of the most important ideas in evolutionary biology. And it's a, a model that's designed to explain the origin of what are called eukaryotic cells or complex cells. So in nature, there are two different cell types, the types of cells that, that are represented by bacteria, which are small cells that have a cell wall but no kind of internal structures whatsoever. And then there's the cells that people would probably be familiar with from a biology mm -hmm. textbook with a nucleus and organelles and all these internal membrane it's systems. It's going to have the Golgi apparatus in there, those are, so the, the yeah, common yeah, cell that we're right. thinking about. Okay. And so the question is, how do these types of cells uh, appear? Mm -hmm. How do they evolve? And so the endosymbiont hypothesis is designed to explain the, the origin of, of what are called eukaryotic cells or complex cells. And so presumably the challenge is you go from this relatively simple structure to one where there's this lot of internal structure. Okay. How do you get that? So what, how does, what does the endosymbiont hypothesis say accounts for that? Yeah, well, this is an idea who, uh, who's, uh, who was advocated for by a scientist by, Lynn, by the name of Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, she had this idea that you'd have a, a mother cell, a mm -hmm. mother bacterial cell, that would have engulfed uh, other cells. And those cells that become engulfed would establish a permanent symbiotic relationship where those cells would reside in the interior of this larger cell. Mm -hmm. And over time, that endosymbiotic relationship would become so integrated that the, the endosymbiont would give up some of its genes. It would lose parts of its genome and hmm. become, in, in a sense, enslaved to the mother cell. Uh, and and uh, yet the mother cell would create an environment where this organelle now could thrive. It could, it could live. And so the, 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 the endosymbiont would provide usually ATP compounds that are used to drive cellular processes mm -hmm. for the mother cell, and the mother cell, again, would provide nutrients for this endosymbiont. And so, again, over time, the idea is that this would morph into these complex cells. So, Okay, so the basic idea, as I understand it, is you've got a whole bunch of cells there. One gets engulfed in another for whatever reason, and in the process of doing that, uh, the environment of being protected means what's inside no longer has to do that. It'll lose some functions, right. but it will be supplying resources and materials to the mother cell. So you end up developing this community, presumably the nucleus, the mitochondria, that right. sort of stuff would all have been developed in that sort of fashion. Right. So fits fits very well in an evolutionary scenario. I could see that. Uh, what sort is there any good evidence for that? Well, I mean, the evidence for it would be basically the similarity between organelles and, and bacteria. So the quintessential example is the mitochondria, mm -hmm. which is this bean-shaped structure in cells that, that is like the powerhouse of the cell. It produces the energy that the cell needs to operate, and it has uh, in some superficial similarities to certain types of bacteria. Hmm. And so people argue, well, this is <clears throat> evidence for endosymbiosis or mm -hmm. the endosymbiont hypothesis. Well, and this, this has, the mitochondria has the DNA in it. So that, 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 that's part of what gives a little bit of right. credence to that. Yeah, it has a small circular piece of DNA that people believe are the remnants of that, that cell's genome mm -hmm. uh, that was then lost over this, through this process of what's called genome reduction. So you've written an article about this where humans have been able to go do this endosymbiosis in the lab. Kind of flesh out the details, what's going on there. Yeah, well, the, the, the idea is to try to understand in, in specific detail how this process happened. And so people used a, a yeast cell, uh, which that was representative of the mother cell, mm -hmm. and they created a yeast cell that was deficient in the production of 
ATP. It's it's mitochondria weren't working really well. So ATP is kind of like a power power yeah. molecule, if you, you will. You can think of it like as the gasoline for okay. the cell. All right. And and so what they then did is they took a bacterium E. coli and they engineered it so that the E. coli could not produce a certain uh, compound needed for its survival. Okay. And and so it would have to rely on the yeast cell for that compound, whereas the yeast would have to rely on the E. coli for uh, its ATP production. Mm -hmm. and, they, and so they ended up going through a fairly elaborate process of genetic engineering to get the yeast cell to live in the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. uh, and it not only included uh, uh, um, having the, ye the E. coli, sorry, dependent upon uh, the, the yeast for its, this, this essential mm -hmm. nutrient, but they also had to engineer what was called an ATP transporter that would take <clears throat> ATP from the center of the E. coli and dump it into the yeast cell mm. so that the yeast cell could use that. So they actually had to find that from an, an organism that was already an endosymbiont hmm. in order to do that. And then they had to figure out how to get the E. coli to survive in the yeast cell because the yeast cell would basically break it down, uh, mm -hmm. treating it like a foreign material. And so they actually had to take three or four genes from different bacteria and assemble them in such a way that to protect the E. coli from these breakdown pathways that existed inside the yeast cell. So, so it wasn't just sufficient to knock out part of what the yeast cell needed, knock, or engineer this to produce that, putting it together didn't work. It seemed like there is, you're describing a number of other steps that they had to put in place in right. order for it to work. And this is just to get what people believe to be the very, very first step in the process of endosymbiogenesis. It's, there's so many other steps that are needed for that to happen. This is just the very first step. And, and so what you see is it takes an enormous amount of ingenuity on the part of the researchers mm -hmm. to, to even establish that, that endosymbiotic relationship. You know, that, that is just fascinating that uh, it's, it's not that we can't figure out how this might have happened, but uh, you know, it seems to me reasonable that maybe some sort of endosymbiosis did happen, but it seems like it's very engineered to do, that it, it points towards a mind behind it, not just right. random processes, if Right, you will. and so this to me is, is the dilemma or the irony is that in the attempt to try to understand how endosymbiogenesis would have happened in an evolutionary framework, these researchers actually showed intelligent agency is critical to get that first step established. So ironically, they're providing evidence for uh, design or for creation as the explanation for the origin of eukaryotic cells, not evolution. Fascinating comments. Thank you, Fuzz. You know, the endosymbiont hypothesis for a long time has been a fairly prominent challenge to a creationist way of looking at life because it seems to support the evolutionary ideas. But as we're exploring that and trying to understand it more deeply, ironically, it actually points towards a creator, a well-designed system that has a mind behind it. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and look for Fuzz's blog on this topic. Search for endosymbiont hypothesis, and the title of the article is Endosymbiont Hypothesis and the Ironic Case for a Creator. And as you read through that and understand that, you will be well equipped to respond to this challenge that you're likely to face if you point towards and advocate for a creation worldview.